ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وجاهد في الله حق المجاهدة حتى أتاه اليقين فنصلي عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ الأعلى يا رب العالمين أصيكم نفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل كما جاء في محكم التنزيل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون. Dear brothers and sisters, we begin with praise. Praise and gratitude is the essence of who we are. We did not deserve to be created. We did not create ourselves. We were blessed to exist by the blesser. We were blessed to exist by the provider the sustainer, the maintainer, the loving, compassionate, forgiving, merciful one. So we seek his guidance and we seek his forgiveness as we live in a life that seeks to exalt his perfection and praise all of his glory. I bear witness that there is no deity and nothing worthy of worship except for God alone and I bear witness that Muhammad was his final messenger and servant he sent to mankind so that we could all realize the true mission of life in servitude to the maker of life. A lot of Muslims living in America find themselves in a dilemma when it comes to culture and religion. You have many Muslims who have been living here for centuries from the African American community. And They've gone through various changes and their community has uh, grappled with certain things related to culture and identity. Then we have a large group of people since the 1960s who have moved here more and more each decade since then, seeking a better life, seeking opportunity. And so they have cultures and religiosity that they come from and they are used to. Then they come here and they see there are many different things going on and they find themselves in a dilemma. So as people who are truly seeking divine guidance, we have to understand what is a spiritual thing, what is a religious thing, and what is a cultural human thing. And so with spiritual things, we want to derive our spirituality and our religiosity from the revelation that we have ratified as through a prophet. We know the Holy Quran and the Sunnah is what brought us here and that is what we are following. When it comes to culture, we need to see which actions are in agreement with our scripture or that do not conflict with our scripture. And when that happens, then those customs become our customs or even if we choose not to follow those customs, for sure our kids and their kids will follow these customs. That's the nature of human beings. They are from the people that they were born amongst. So, there's a famous hadith. بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا فَطُوبَى لِلْغُرَبَى this hadith is unquestionable in its chain of narration and if you understand it, it makes perfect sense. The meaning is, Islam came as something or started as something strange and it will return as something strange. So glad tidings and goodness be for the strangers. Imam Al-Qadi Ibn al Riyadh. He explained this hadith. He said, what this was referring to is that when the Prophet ﷺ first received revelations and he started to teach his family and close friends, they were a very small group. And 
the belief system and the lifestyle and moral reality that they were embracing was very strange to what was the norm in Mecca. So the meaning of the hadith was that Islam started as a small group of people who are distinguished in their beliefs, in their worship, in their character and values, priorities of life. So this is what the hadith means. So it will return as something strange, meaning what? When the Prophet ﷺ said this, Islam had become normal in Arabia. It became the way that everybody knows because the vast majority of people have embraced it. The Prophet ﷺ was prophesying that there will be a time again when to truly follow Islam and not to just follow what people are doing that are not Muslim and going along with that, that that will become strange again. So then he says, Tuba lil So glad tidings to the strangers, meaning those who will stick to their faith and their values and not compromise their religion and their spirituality to fit in or please people that are not Muslim or that are not following Islam but happen to be Muslim. Right? So that is the meaning. Does this hadith mean that we should become separatist people, exclusive in our ways, that we have our religion and so we're going to stick with people who we know from our religion or from our cultural background and we'll be at our mosque, we'll go back to our homes and then perhaps go to a halal restaurant that fits our cultural that is not what the hadith means. We know that the Prophet ﷺ was an Arab and he spoke Arabic and he understood and lived by Arabic customs. And that was the reality of all Prophets. We've talked about this before. We've established this as an unquestionable fact from the Quran and the Sunnah. So, what does it mean? Because the Prophet ﷺ, the polytheists around him, they were dressed in the same outfit as him. He didn't start saying, okay, let's dress in a different outfit because the polytheists are dressing in these outfits. He didn't say, let's not eat the food like them because that, they are this way. The polytheists sat on the floor and ate with their hand. That was Arabic culture. People have a hard time in studying their own religion. What is the difference? Is that a holy thing revealed by Allah? Or did that happen to be just something everybody did in Arabia? Now the Prophet ﷺ taught about how you would eat health-wise, proper proportions, clean, hygienic, wash with this hand, eat with that hand. He taught certain parameters that would distinguish the Muslims, but sitting on the floor and eating with hands was a polytheistic Arab culture as well as an ancient Hindu Indian culture. That's what they were doing, why what they were doing it. A lot of Muslims don't ever ask why, and they go along with things thinking that something that's culture is religion, and it's not. It's a human reality, not taught by the religion. But they said, well, because we saw the Prophet ﷺ doing that, then it must be religion. No, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ was doing things as a human being that had nothing to do with religion and spirituality. So we have to basically find where do we draw the line. So when it says, مَن تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever would imitate a people is among them. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ dressed and ate like Arabs made him an Arab. So was that evil? Is that haram? Was the Prophet ﷺ doing something wrong? I don't think so. What the hadith is referring to if you study a proper analysis of it from our great scholarly tradition is whoever would imitate someone in something that is against Islam or following a religion other than Islam, then they will be counted among them. There's where the serious meaning of the hadith comes in. So there are various ways that when we look at ourselves as an American Muslim community, 
that we need to reflect upon maybe we're doing things and acting in ways that we shouldn't do or we're shy to be Muslim because we feel like we're fitting in and pleasing people I've talked about it before I'm gonna keep hammering the point until the non-Muslims I meet say yeah I've seen many Muslims praying that's normal but what I come to find out is that most Muslims will be willing to miss a prayer for men because I don't want to you know create a conflict with somebody because I'm making my religion apparent you don't have to pray right in the middle of where people are standing you find a place to pray and you don't have to hide you don't say well I'm not gonna pray because there's no secret place for me to pray you don't do like that because the Prophet said Al -ardu li masjidan. the whole earth was made a place for me to prostrate to pray that's what he said in the hadith in Bukhari and so we need to make sure that we are very comfortable praying wherever we are when the time for prayer comes because the Prophet sallallahu said as salatu fi waqtiha the prayer must be in its time it is a major serious sin to allow the time go out and make some just a and then some brother said one time one to me he said well my wife's not going to pray out in public I said why he said because then they will see her and I said does she take off her clothes to pray what do you mean she's already out there walking around if she's going to the grocery store she's gonna have to get something off the bottom shelf and come up should she not do that what does she do there's some cultural things that exaggerated and made rules that we don't find in the Quran and the Sunnah people just thought oh we're gonna protect women and there's a slew of exaggerations in the religion of Islam with the good intention of protecting women but actually it's not taught by the Prophet Sallallahu and many times it conflicts like we, we hear mashallah the Saudi government and uh, society has embraced the seventh century of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu teaching in which we know that his wife was riding a camel on her own the Sunnah she was riding the camel it took them this long to allow a woman to drive the car to go back to the Sunnah what we saw the Prophet doing allowing which is a tacit approval Iqrar Sunni so these are things that we learn another thing that I'm concerned about is not setting boundaries of male and female interactions people say well I have to you know my colleagues at work I have to give them hugs and everything and it's just a it's a harmless thing no it is not a harmless thing if you you are men you know how physical touch even if it's not skin to skin between a male and a female there is something that happens in your mind this is not a, a strict rigid religious opinion this is called psychology it's a fact of the way the human brain works it is why there is lots of people in the world they got close and then something happened and then we have kids that's how, it, that's how it works so the Quran and the Sunnah identified some boundaries for us so in interacting with between the genders we know that in the family there's no marriage in the family so those are free to interact fine but if you're going to be so there's a difference between you are in a professional setting and this person you don't know them and the culture here is that it is a sign of respect to shake someone's hand it's not like some sort of you know feeling that they think like that no it's a sign of respect I recognize you I respect you nice to meet you that many of the great scholars have said is a passing thing that to stop that thing and do something like this and try to make some religious exp explanation is going to create a problem that the harm of that in representing Muslims is bigger than what you think you're protecting yourself from but if you're going to work with people or your neighbors that you will see you know this is someone who I will interact with on a regular basis so we need to keep the interaction professional and respect personal space 
So you would say the first time you met them respectfully, then you would let them know or a manager know at your work or let your neighbor know that in our faith, we really cherish chastity and modesty. So we prefer to keep uh, a personal space uh, separation so that there is no uh, strange feelings between us. It's our, it's our way. It may seem strange to you, but just letting you know uh, that's how we are. And it means no disrespect to you. It's celebrating chastity and modesty. So is it strange? Yes. Is it bad? No. I can't imagine somebody saying, well, you're evil. How dare you practice chastity and modesty? Those things are way outdated and no good. Who's going to say that? I mean, the society's kind of moving in that direction, but the devil likes to trick people. Because anyone who thinks about the word chastity and modesty says those are good things. Anyone. Anybody in the world that thinks about those two terms, that those are good things. But you have to set those boundaries. I was once... Uh, a brother invited me to someone that he works with, his colleague. This person, she put her hand out. How you doing, ma'am? Nice to meet you. Then the brother, I could see him. He's trying to hug like this, so that the actual real embrace doesn't happen. And that looks more awkward than just explaining to her, I prefer we just not physically. <laughs> it's like, what are we doing? So this is where we uh, would separate ourselves. You have Muslims saying, well, my kids really want to go to the water park or the pool. And you know good and well, there are going to be naked women at that pool. But you say, well, we're in America. No. You have times and places you can go to swim that there's not naked women there. You've got to preserve your value. You don't go to that place like that. That's against our religion. Quran and Sunnah are very clearly teaching us to avoid those places to get the wrong thoughts, to be focusing on impure thoughts. We shouldn't be doing that. I have to say it's an amazing thing. Uh, our sisters who are wearing a full hijab. By the way, just so that we know, the word hijab is not an Arabic word that means scarf. Scarf is a scarf. It is a kind of a thing you wrap on your head or it comes on your head. Hijab is like a modest style of dress, head to toe, that is generally preserving modesty and it is head to toe. So the scarf is a part of the hijab. But you see some sister very comfortable with the lower part and then she put this on muhajjaba. Then you have another sister who's very modest from here down and her reality is she's not comfortable or she's not practicing the scarf part. You should not judge this one and think, oh well that one because she wrapped something around her head. We shouldn't be judging anybody because Allah is Maliki Yawmuddin. It's easy for us men to try to tell a woman how to dress when you don't get looks every single day. This is a big jihad some of the sisters are doing and some of them are contemplating or having a hard time with. So, when you talk about what kind of way you entertain yourself. So, does the Muslim adopt uh, rated R means if you're over 17, that's halal. We don't follow that. We look at the content. There's an app, get it on your phone. It's called Kids in Mind. Some Christians made a beautiful app. And it says Kids in Mind. They take every movie, they watch it, and they write every detail that happens in that movie that has to do with sexuality, profanity, and violence. And then they take the whole themes, the concepts that are the themes of it, and then they write that about the theme. So every movie you could know, this is the better system to use. Because when you see, because it's 1 through 10, 10, it means it's unquestionably haram. Yet, I mean many 
I was in another place and my son said my friend who's 10 years old went to see this movie some movie called Deadpool and the profanity was 10 the violence was 8 and the other one was 7 I said what parent what Muslim parent in their right mind then I made a justification He's telling his dad, this is a Marvel comic guy. That's the trick. Then I came to find out dad took him to the movie. No way. So as a Muslim, we will not entertain ourselves with something that is completely filled with, you know, haram language and attitudes and themes. And this is something we don't say, oh, well, I'm an adult. Therefore, no, I'm a Muslim. Therefore, I don't watch rated R. You see? So I'm a Muslim. You say, well, that's good for me. I come to find out, in trying to help families, sometimes I find out that a brother that I thought was pretty much a good guy coming to the mosque, sometimes things happen in the house and he starts using very foul language, F words and all of this. I'm trying to think, where did that come from? What you put in to these and these, it comes out of here. If you're willing to watch movies with the F word all up in it and the B-I-T-C-H and all those other things, you're going to talk like that. It's going to come out of you because you have put it in there. No Muslim should be doing that. You have to protect your soul, your heart. What goes in the eyes and the ears becomes part of you, becomes who you are. It's the same thing with the kids. If you just ask your child, I don't know why you would give them a smartphone, I personally would advise completely against this. There are so many ways it will ruin a child. But if you looked at many of their iPods or their Play or whatever it is, you'll find some very sick, foul stuff. And then if you ask them about it, you know what they'll say? I like the beat, Baba. It's a cool beat. But what about all this filthy, foul, disgusting language which is completely against our religion? Oh, well, I'm not listening to that. Oh, yes, you are. You're being programmed. For sure the devil's in there. But you've got to be careful. So we have to draw the line somewhere as Muslims. Sometimes Muslims feel they get into politics. And they feel like, well... I like this thing or that thing or I feel like I can so I'm going to side with some people on things that I know are contradicting my religion you can't do that you gotta be who you are you gotta draw the line you could say I disagree with this lifestyle and practice just like I disagree with this one say for example can you have a friend and respect Christian people of course you can no problem but I'm not going to affirm and promote their worship of Jesus Christ because that's against my religion you see the difference I respect you as a human being you have the right to be a human being and it's between you and God how you live your life but I'm not gonna go out and promote and stand up for a belief system or a lifestyle that is completely contrary to my religion just because I fit in with a political group so there's a nuance there that we have to get. We have to look at the holidays that we find in front of us. What is a holiday? What does the word Eid mean? Some people think, well I can tell you for sure, the Saudi scholars generally look at the term Eid and they say it's any time. Anybody picks a day out and appreciates something in that day. That is not what Eid is. Eid is a religious celebration of a particular religious belief or practice. That is Eid. We have two of them. Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Those are Eids. Meaning, we are specifically doing worship as Muslims in that day celebrating something very holy and religious. Just like Christmas and Easter. These are Eids for Christian people. 
This is known as a religious holiday celebrating the two fundamental beliefs of their religion. They're believing that they're celebrating the birth of their Lord. And many of the Christmas songs say that, literally. And that is the mainstream dogma of Christianity. They're saying the, the birth of their Lord. And then they're saying, He was killed and resurrected on this day, Easter. So for a Muslim to take part in any part of those celebrations is going to be against your religion. That's religion. Those are people who are practicing something that is in complete contradiction to our beliefs. And even the most liberal of the mainstream Jewish community has no problem saying they don't want to do that. I'm not saying all of them, but particularly the rabbinical group that I know, the rabbis. I don't do Christmas. I respect my Christian neighbors, they can do Christmas, Merry Christmas they say. But I don't celebrate it and I don't follow it because they don't believe that. Here's what a lot of people don't know. Halloween is a religious holiday. Yes. It is a holiday called Samhain. It is a day that modern capitalism thought they can make billions of dollars out of. They took it from the pagan Celtic society of ancient England for thousands of years before Christianity. The Celtic people of Scotland and Ireland and all of that, the Galen people, they had a holiday called Samhain on October 31st. And they have all of these practices. Today, in America, there are 1.2 million neo-pagan, Wiccan, religious devotees. That's their religion. They have these spirits and these gods that they are worshipping. Samhain is a big holiday. And on their websites, right now, you will see orange, black and silver, jack-o'-lanterns. These are symbols of our religion. All of the practices going on, whether it be taking walks around the neighborhood and treats and this and dressing up scary and all of that, all of those come from thousands of years old, still practiced today by over a million Americans who are pagans, witches, wicked. So that is a holiday that is not Islam. Prophet ﷺ was sent with a message. ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ This ayah has a very important point. We have sent you with a message. With a lifestyle, with a law system. Follow it. Don't follow the desires of people who don't know. Who don't know what your religion is and who don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Either one, الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Now some people will say, Imam, come on. This is some harmless customary thing. It's just about kids having fun. The fact is, this is a statement that is branded and influenced and molded by the materialistic capitalist system that needs to make money out of this religious holiday. And it's trying to let religious people know that it's not something that conflicts with you because they need everybody to buy in to make all that money. And so now you're willing to put aside a divinely revealed spiritual system in order to fit in or make people happy that are in contradiction with that religion. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are the people who know the same as those who don't know? إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ Those who will be reminded are those who are deeply well thought out. And it's interesting because people would picture a religious person as someone who just blindly follows something. In capitalism, most people blindly, capital secular atheism, most people are just blindly following that. Acting like they're all enlightened. We need to be enlightened Muslims and follow our religion and be willing to be a stranger whenever it uh, conflicts with our religion.
Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu rasulillah, wa alayhi wa sahbihi ajma'in. In summary, for um, some of our uh, brothers and sisters who came late, the religion has been miraculously preserved. We have well established revelation. And the knowledge, the scholarly commentary on it is connected. For 1,400 years, we have these scholars from here, these scholars from here, this opinion, that opinion. And in many times, in many legal systems, the scholar needs to be privy to the local custom to know what's going on in order to give the proper ruling on something. And so there are things that we need to review in what we're doing and why we're doing it to make sure that what we're doing is living a spiritual life that is in concordance with our revelation and with the divine revealed and preserved message. And when we find something that is in opposition to it, we have to be ready and willing to make ourselves be a stranger and stand up. If we don't do that, then there's a problem in our faith. Because if I'm saying, yes, I believe in Islam, I believe in the Prophet ﷺ, I believe in the scriptures that I have, and I know that the scholars have inherited from the Prophets, then I have to follow whatever that, because it's not just like an opinion. It's a legal system. There is a me methodology of scientific proportion of how do we weigh issues and derive rulings and come to a conclusion about the proper understanding of Islam for these people or for those people. Because it could differ from time to place. And this is not my opinion. This is what all scholars have said in the history of Islam. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us, to make us of those who are truly dedicated. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept from us a life that is in your service and make us of those who are pleased to live a life in your contentment. Ya Allah, do not allow our hearts to stray. Do not allow us to be a people who are trying to please other people when it is displeasing to you. Ya Allah, help us to balance and understand our identity as American Muslims. Ya Allah, help us to balance and understand our identity as people who live in America. Ya Allah, please forgive us for our sins, for our laziness, for our lack of understanding. Emphasize in us and give us a proper understanding of this message. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us a people who when we die, that we are embraced by your holy angels who take us up into the heavens and we are recorded among the people of heaven. Ya Allah, help us to see the spiritual and not be fooled by the material. Ya Allah, help us to be firm and have audacity and dignity to stand up for what we know is right, even if somebody else may not understand it or agree with it. Ya Allah, make us a people who are proud to be your servants. Ya Allah, help us to be a people who love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and follow his example and make him our ultimate leader in our lives. Ya Allah, we ask you to send your peace, blessings and mercy upon Muhammad and all of those who follow him until the day of judgment.